round of applause for that. I had an opportunity to lead a Satanist to Jesus and pray for his deliverance. This kid came to the conference, got dragged by his parents, got, had enough drugs for four days, then ran out of drugs, went outside and bought heroin for $400. Start manifesting in his room. The next morning they brought him to the service. He came, this guy literally had like a death face, completely just, just, just death inside of his face. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. I didn't know who he was on the stage until after he comes up to me, begins to confess those things. I start leading him to Jesus, literally his face in front of me started to change. I gave him some money to buy the Good Morning Holy Spirit book and he's like, I got the money. I'm like, I know. I'm like, with this I'm sowing into your future. And so, um, and then I really genuinely believe his life is radically going to change for the glory of God. Come on somebody. Let's put our hands together for Jesus Christ. And God did a lot of awesome miracles. I remember one lady that I prayed for last year in the same conference from Germany. She couldn't get married for over 20 years. And so, um, you know, you know, she's not, uh, um, how do I say this properly? Uh, it was a spiritual problem. It wasn't a physical problem. <laughs> okay, that's what I want to say. Um, and so I remember I prayed for her and um, this year her friend who was with her came up to me. He's like, you remember you prayed for this lady who couldn't get married? I was like, yes I did. He's like, you know why she's not here this week? I was like, why? Well, she's engaged and she's actually getting married now. And so God completely broke the curse over her life. Now, not every person who is not married has a curse, okay? But in her case it was because she really wanted to get married. I remember I had a word of knowledge and one person sitting right in the first row had a big shoulder uh, problem and uh, God instantly uh, healed them. Uh, I remember praying even for uh, deliverance, many cases of deliverance. One particular that really stood out to me is when, um, when one lady had a dragon in a dream that entered into her and then because of that she heard in a dream, from now on you will seduce men. She started to seduce married men and she was married herself, five children, wonderful lady, wonderful husband, Christian lady, devout to God. She says something comes on me in the room and these weird men begin to be attracted to me and I cannot control these intrusive thoughts for other men. Though I love my husband and my husband is wonderful and, uh, and she says I know it's demonic, I know when it entered me, I just need somebody to help me get it out. And so as we started to pray, the lady started to shake, scream and yell and, and I genuinely believe she testified that she felt something like lifted her and stuff and then we ended up praying for her husband later and stuff and so but I genuinely believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is to heal the sick, cast out devils, break the curses and to bring people into salvation. Church, put your hands together for Jesus. I want to throw a challenge to every person. This 1000 soul harvest that I'm believing for bleeding for inside. I ask you that you if you're a genuine follower of Jesus you have to understand Jesus says if you follow me I will teach you to fish. He didn't say I'll teach you to make money. He didn't say I'll teach you to not cuss and not to do bad things. Though these things are important. He says I'll teach you to fish meaning I'll teach you to influence others into a relationship with Jesus Christ. What is your goal this year? How many people are you dreaming this year to bring to Christ? Because if I ask a question today, how many people came to the Lord through you personally last year? And if, if somebody didn't have anybody that came to Jesus through you personally, many hands will go up. So I want this year to be different. A gentleman came to me before the service and he said, Vlad, last year, he said, my dream is to see 10 people give their life to Jesus this year through me. And I said, why don't you bump it to 50? He said, you have to understand that last year, it's been the first time in 20 years that I led somebody to Jesus Christ. And you may say wow but if I ask you, you will realize that people coming to Jesus here is not necessarily the one that, that you're bringing to the Lord. So I want to challenge you this year, one person a month, at least 10 people to the Lord that you bring, that you pray for. You may say but I'm shy. Pray and obey. That's all. You, you pray, when we pray for souls, you pray at home and then you obey. What do you obey? You obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. In your area where God will lead you, in your workplace, maybe coffee shop, in the gym, in the sauna. And if you have no places where you can bring others to the Lord, I'll give you a place. Every Sunday, especially today at 1.30 in Starbucks in the mall. They meet and they're going to go to the mall and they witness and they share the message of Jesus Christ. That is not for Glenn. That is not for someone else. That is for every person. If you have no other fishing pond where you search for souls, go to that one. But do something for salvation of souls. Don't just go to a church where they save souls. They cast out demons. They. Be the person that you do that as well. Because the Bible says a group of people came to Jesus and they said, we cast out devils. You know what that meant? That means we belong to a congregation that cast out demons. But we ourselves 
Jesus says but you practice lawlessness he said the group that you were part of did that but you lived completely in sin and you lived completely away from God let's not be those people let's be passionate and let's be aggressive to see the kingdom of God come into our city and into people's lives if you think we're pushing the message of Jesus on people you heard the story you, you, you saw that the message of Jesus is the only message that is able to help and deliver and change our people and our generation so I challenge each one of you I started to take this personally during this week when I was there at the conference in Carolina the pastor he challenged people to sow into into whatever vision they have and so and I, I texted I didn't have I think I had like 70 bucks in my checkings but I have an emergency fund me and my wife we have an emergency fund and so I texted my wife and I said I really feel strongly that I need to sow a thousand dollars um, to take it from our emergency fund and so when I have a wonderful fabulous wife she's like whatever you say I'm all with it I, you know the only thing I want is really salvation of souls and so and I literally I took that thousand dollars I started to pray I started to weep and God started to give me I have the vision but I felt like this week the vision just grabbed my heart and just literally just just possessed me after that the amazing part is two days later someone else came to me and gave me a thousand dollars and then some more people but then you sing and and when that happened when this pastor whom I know really awesome man of God came to me during worship says hey I want to bless you and I looked at that and I saw a thousand dollars I kind of got mad I was like God you know I wasn't asking you for money I wasn't asking you for return on money I don't need that I mean I want that but but I, I, that's just the, I need a thousand souls God I'm, and I was really saying like Lord if that's all that's gonna come from that sac sacrifice I'm gonna tear this check apart because I didn't sow that so that I can get a thousand dollars I can always find a thousand dollars I just want a thousand souls to be saved this year and so even at the conference you know where all the awesome speakers and God gives me the prompting to start praying for salvation of souls and then literally people who started to come for salvation of souls there at the conference and they have to pay some 600 or something dollars to be there but there was a lot of them that were dragged by their parents and they start responding to the altar call and that grace upon our life is not an accident it's because we genuinely want and then that want possesses us to see people saved can somebody say amen put your hands together for Jesus I just ask you set a goal set a goal sacrifice into the goal believe this year through my home group through me the Lord will save people if you've never seen it for years let this be the year where those things change can somebody say amen are you gonna do the church we're gonna see a thousand soul harvest for the glory of God hallelujah hallelujah today I want us to continue the the topic that I started last Sunday and if you were not here last Sunday I highly encourage you to go and and listen to the message on the rhythm of revival where we focused on healing on how God's word is like a medicine and how God wants to establish within us not just a moment but a momentum not just a a leap but a lifestyle not just an event where we get charged but God wants to develop a a, a walk a, a journey with him and benefits of that we discussed last Sunday is healing people as they went in obedience to Jesus they were healed today I want to speak about self-deliverance now uh, that word is a is a bad word what I mean by self-deliverance is not that you can deliver yourself we know that only Jesus can deliver us amen but in a sense that you can experience deliverance in your life by not just somebody praying for you you can experience deliverance in your life, in your journey with God, in your walk with God. You can see Jesus Christ deliver you even from demons and curses. Where no one prayed for you directly. But your prayer life, your fasting, your journey with the Holy Spirit, your home group participation has a benefit. When you establish as a lifestyle, it has a benefit. And one of the benefits is that you will first see that you need deliverance. You will still first see that something is holding on to you and then you will have the grace by God to be free from that and to maintain that freedom by walking with God. Not just by coming to Jesus for prayer or going to a conference prayer line or going to a prayer line in our church. Amen. We mentioned that before and I want to always kind of repeat that there is three types of curses. There is the earned curses, there is the cast curses and there is generational curses. So earned curses is when you do something, you step on the devil's territory. Cast curse is when you upset somebody or hurt somebody and they pronounce a curse over your life. Or 
person in authority like your parents teachers they say something really negative in your direction i remember one lady uh, came to me for prayer and she went to this uh, particular demonic procedure where uh, somebody uh, poked her with nail with, with needles uh, she mentioned to me um, what, what she did she goes to this pastor after this for prayer this pastor prays for her and then says this to her he said your children are gonna have big problems because of what you did and after that her children start having problems so she comes to me and asks me a question she says is it because of what I did or is it because of what he said because see many times when somebody in authority and I said listen that pastor he's not mature that's not right to begin to bring curse and speak death over people's life and he can bring a curse on your children because of speaking that and so she we prayed over that we break even the power of those words that's called a cast curse when you pronounce curses on other people generational curse is something that repeats in your life goes from one generation to another a lot of addictions a lot of sicknesses and a lot of demonic attacks in people's lives are a result of things that are generational meaning it's not you're not the first person in your family to face this amen in Deuteronomy chapter 28 we see seven symptoms of curses I will go through this quickly if you have a Bible app called Uversion you click on events there and you will see the notes for this message there in detail the the symptoms of curses the number one symptom of a curse or a demonic attack in person's life is mental breakdown when the person emotionally and mentally is not stable many times this is a sign of a curse the second one is repeated chronic sicknesses it's when you have sicknesses in your life that are chronic and they constantly repeat. The third thing is barrenness and miscarriage. Fourth one is divorce. Fifth one is constant financial lack. And sixth one repeated accidents and premature deaths or uh, when people do not die at the right time. I understand that looking at this you may say some of these troubles disciples of Jesus faced like you know financial lack and some people experienced a certain attacks they died early. We have to understand the Lord doesn't promise to deliver us from persecution. Jesus and the apostles died because they were persecuted for their faith. The Lord doesn't promise us to deliver us from that. He promises to be with us in that and occasionally He does deliver. God promises us to deliver us from the devils, from demons, from curses and many of these things are caused by nothing short but the devil. Amen. Today we're going to focus specifically on the issue of addiction, on the issue of bondage. In the gospel, in, in the Bible, there's a verse in Romans chapter 8 verse 15. It says this, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage. Somebody say spirit of bondage. You did not receive the spirit of bondage. Bondage is an addiction. I want you to see here that Jesus is revealing through the writer of book of Romans that there is a demon behind addictions repeated unbroken habits many times have a spirit behind them and if you ever been addicted to something you can testify to the reality of the fact that you don't want that you're fighting that you're putting all kinds of guardrails against that and that keeps slipping you and pushing you back in it's not because you're a bad person it's not because you, even you lack willpower many times listen to me very carefully Bible says many times it's because we received spirit of bondage and Paul is trying to say that God didn't give us that that came from someone else some other spirit gave that and it's the devil's spirit I've read a list of addictions you know 40 million of people in the United States are addicted to smoking 4.2 million are addicted to marijuana 18 million are addicted to alcohol 1.8 million are addicted to painkillers, 821,000 are addicted to cocaine, 426,000 are addicted to heroin, Th thousands are addicted to gambling, sex, internet, shopping and that could be an addiction. Video games is a huge one, plastic surgery, when people are addicted to uh, gluttony, when they constantly eat, small little trouble and they go into eating. And that could become an addiction. Uh, chewing ice, eating rocks, eating nails, eating coins, eating chalk, eating clay, eating feces, ashes, dirt, toilet and paper. These are now actually have names for these dysfunctions when people are addicted to. And of course addiction to pornography or addicted to uh, watching explicit material. And these are addictions. Many times behind these addictions 
are demonic spirits that hold people captive and hold people in bondage. Today through this message I want to help people who are in addiction. Myself experiencing certain of them and uh, seeing God's grace in helping me to overcome and having a church where we see people who've been free. I want to share just a few simple thoughts that will help you to get strengthened to receive freedom from God. And then we're going to pray against the spiritual forces behind addictions. And we're going to pray for the viewers who are watching us who have those addictions in Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? If you have your notes, I want you to write down point number one. Stop dating Delilah. Stop dating Delilah. Now Delilah, I don't mean uh, that you, that particular girl. Delilah speaks of a woman in Samson's life that Samson asked, listen to this, he asked her to bind him. Delilah represents people in your life you like but you know you shouldn't be with. They trigger the sin in your life. It's the circles in your life that if you go that it, you feel so relaxed your guard is down and then they bring the alcohol and you know that for you that is a struggle. So you put yourself in a way where Delilah something you like but it's not something you should be around and then she binds you with ropes but because you tell yourself I can break them you keep breaking them breaking them but there will be a day when Delilah will bind you with a rope you will not be able to break. The Bible says he got up and said I will lose myself as before but the Lord left him. God's protection is on your life but that protection begins to lift when you step into the house of Delilah. When you step and you lay your head on the lap of Delilah. Many people will experience deliverance if they will only delete the numbers of people who are selling them drugs and inviting them to a places where they get buzzed. It's very spiritual. Just delete it. Just leave it alone. Because Delilah, she will put you on her lap. You will lose all kinds of discipline and then she will bind you. And that bondage is not the devil's fault. And the bondage is that you gave her your hands to bind you with. And you can cry there until you lose your voice for God to deliver you. But God can only deliver you from your enemies, not from your friends. When you make Delilah your friend, if you make her someone you flirt with, someone you play with, someone that you like, next thing that happens, you cannot have the audacity to ask God to deliver you from something you feed every single day. You have to hate it. You have to struggle with it. You have to fight it. You have to want to be free from that. Can somebody say amen? When Jesus spoke against the devil in the wilderness and he rebuked him, Jesus was in the wilderness, speaks of separation. And Jesus was fasting, speaks of discipline. And then he said, devil get behind me. See my power against the devil is congruent or consistent with how much separation do I have from the house of Delilah. And how much discipline am I applying to my spiritual life. See if my life is not disciplined. If every single junk is on my phone, all kinds of music, all kinds of movies and all kinds of stuff, material, things that are constantly poisoning my soul and I'm putting myself in the way where there is bad people or people that are just I shouldn't be with. They're constantly tempting me to my old life and then I get up and say I rebuke you Satan. Satan is going to laugh. That's exactly what Delilah did. Delilah will laugh at you and the Satan is not going to be bound. Satan is going to bind you. When Jesus spoke against the devil, it's because he was fasting and he was in the wilderness. When Samson got up to fight the Philistines, it's because he was napping on her, on her lap and he was in the wrong house. That's why the Bible says, I'm going to go and fight them. See, he believed in charismatic deliverance. I'm going to go because I've done it before. And everything gets lost. He gets up and the Bible says, he didn't know the Lord was not with him. It's not the form of rebuking the devil that empowers you. It's a lifestyle of discipline and separation from the world. If every time you go to the mall and Victoria who has no secrets glares your eyes and draws you in and you're staring. Every single junk that is on your phone, all kinds of immoral things are there and you constantly put yourself in a way. It may be co your co-workers who constantly drink and tempt you, sell you drugs and next thing that happens to you, I rebuke the spirit of drinking, I rebuke the spirit of alcohol, I rebuke that. See you can't rebuke that if you are in Delilah's house napping on her lap. Can somebody say amen? 
You can only rebuke that if, if you get out of the Delilah's house and if you disconnect yourself, remove the, her address from your GPS and begin to focus on God. Then you say, I rebuke you Satan and the Bible says he left. Submit yourself to God and then resist the devil. Knowing that the devil exists and knowing that behind your addiction is a devil, that doesn't give you power. It's submitting yourself to God. Separating yourself from the things that tempt you gives you the power to overcome against the devil. Can somebody say amen? And it's important to remove not only the, 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 the bad addictions, but remove ourselves from the things that are, that are naive, but that are dangerous. That are dangerous. That I call them pet sins that make you into a prisoner of those sins. The pet sins are the things that when, when somebody offended you and you, you, you harbor that offense, okay, for one week it's fine. But second week you keep holding on to that. That thing eventually turns into rage. And ask Cain, that's how the first murder was born. God comes to Cain and he says, you're entertaining. You're feeding on the lap of offense. And he says, the sin is crouching at the door. He says, but you have dominion over it. And he says, throw it away when it's still small. Because once it gets inside, it becomes a spirit of murder. Deal with sins when they are still crouching. Do not deal with sins when they're already crouching and they're already bound you. Deal when they are pet sins and then you'll overcome them. Amen. Like even, you know, in, in my own life, uh, last year I started to notice, you know, the Lord delivered me from, from the spirit of, of pornography. I really believe it was a demon that was tormenting my life. But that what, what I started to realize is that when I start slacking and when I don't live a life separated to God, just because I'm a preacher, I'm not protected. Just because that I have a beautiful wife, that doesn't mean the devil would just say, well, since you got married, I'm going to leave you alone. He doesn't give a care whether I'm married, how many people it's going to destroy. Actually, he likes the fact that when my influence is growing to torment me and hit me because it could affect more people. And I remember finding myself being tempted on Instagram and on Snapchat. I wasn't falling but I was being tempted and I was being drawn to that. Dude, I felt that. I started to fight that. I told my wife, it was last year, and I said, listen, I'm just being really strongly tempted by that. And it's been happening for a few weeks. You know, sometimes you just tell that to your wife and that alone just will deliver you. And she will look at you and say, what did you just say, man of God? I'll rebuke that spirit in Jesus' name. I remember when I said that, I mean, my heart was beating 20 million times. She prayed for me right there in our bed and uh, she delivered me. Did you know how I got delivered? I'm going to tell you the greatest secret to deliverance. I deleted Snapchat <laughs> and Instagram and Facebook. Turn it into a public page where I don't see none of your posts. And so and deleted it out of my phone. That brought another level of deliverance. And I remember when the Lord started dealing with me also how I became addicted to the phone. And so because the phone was the first thing I saw when I went to sleep and the first thing I saw when I woke up. And so the Holy Spirit last year started to prompt me. He said, listen, you have a very gorgeous wife that looks at you every morning. You were dreaming to sleep with a person like that for 24 years. She's here now and you're staring at the screen of your phone in the morning. What kind of madness is that? And so remember I went to Walmart, got an alarm clock because I used my phone for alarm but I used it for everything else and deleted most of the things. Why? Because I want to have authority over the devil. But I can't have that authority if I am in Delilah's house. Meaning if I permit my life to be loosed with technology and with other things. But when you start to begin to separate yourself to God, you begin to see one thing. First of all, many of you will experience the devil will leave you right there. But even if he won't, there will be a power in your command. It's not a technique to cast out demons and attack them. It's a lifestyle separated. You genuinely want to be separated to God. And then your words have power. Can somebody say amen? And so even now, I mean, yeah, I went through withdrawals. I, I understand how every single addict feels. When I woke up in the morning, my phone is not there. You know, I went through it with withdrawals, but by the grace, grace of God, I feel like I might be free from this for permanently. <laughs> so... There are pet sins like addiction to the phone. Like you're constantly on your phone. You, you're going on a date with your wife or with your husband and you're constantly on your phone. You wake up and you check your and you notice the hunger for God is not there. But you're constantly observing and watching those things that are not good. I challenge you today. If you want to be free, take practical steps to separate your life toward the things of God. You will notice a sense of awareness of God's presence and a sense of liberty in your life. You want to stop cheating and having lustful thoughts toward other women as a man? Remove those things that trigger those things. 
remove the hang out with those friends but they're my friends at work I'm influencing to Christ come on give me a break you've never invited them to church and plus the way you guys talk and what you drink and what you do there if they come to church God forbid they see you in church the best thing leave it alone you need to anchor yourself in Christ first before you go winning those people who are more committed to their addiction than you are to Christ come on somebody amen number two increase fire in your life increase fire in your life you want to be free from addiction practically look at your life in which areas am I allowing the trigger points who am I hanging out to that constantly draws me into and which habits do I have that are constantly doing that? Sometimes brothers come to me, you know, on the conferences that I go and they ask me to be delivered from pornography. And when I give them the idea that they can delete their social media, they looked at me like I asked them to kill their mother. Look, you, you mean to say that I, I can disconnect my cable, my, my NBA pass and, and not watch football game? What am I going to do? I was like, you will be surprised. Because many of you are too busy it proving to people you enjoy your life that you don't have time to enjoy it. And if we disconnect, especially a little bit from the social media, put it in the right place, we begin to recognize, listen, actually God's word is powerful. You know, every time that I fly, I'm, I'm on this. Let me get off of this horse before I lose myself in this. But every time I fly, uh, you know, Delta, especially anything that over two hours, they have free movies. And I'm not going to lie to you, secretly I always look forward to the flights because I could catch up to the you know latest movies and uh, and then you know when you're a preacher you kind of always want to look around make sure nobody's watching that you're watching as you know you're watching some of those action people beating each other up and so and uh, and ever since you know the beginning of this year there's one of the things that I started to really not just trim but put it under the foot of the cross is is my uh, my deep addiction for action action movies and uh, so flying to this conference and flying back I found out how much hunger for God's word you can develop if you just say no to movies amazing how much stuff you can get done if you don't watch movies I've learned quick books on the way there on the way back got the message read Bible like 10 days ahead and and I realized like sitting there and and the more you do something the more appetite you have for the very thing that you do if you constantly just watch movies constantly watch movies you're like I don't have time to be with my children don't have time to read the word of God you always have more hunger for movies but when you begin to hunger for the word of God and fill yourself with the word of God God will begin to great give you greater hunger for his word can somebody say amen so the second thing increase fire in your life Apostle Paul goes on the island of Malta and it says this, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on fire, a viper, somebody say viper, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. I want you to notice, as long as there was a little bit of fire, vipers were not coming out. When Paul increased, see Paul didn't like small fires, he always wanted big fires. And God wants you to have that kind of a spirit inside of you. When you are complacent, you can be watching porn and feeling not convicted when you are complacent you can be drinking smoking listen abusing people and feel no conviction at all and feel like you actually have no problem and it's not because you don't have a problem it's because the devil is comfortable in the temperature of your spiritual life he's hiding there you don't even aware of it increase the fire and you will quickly see vipers coming out you will quickly sense a conviction you will quickly look at the same action you were just doing a month before and say oh my god holy spirit is not pleased with that but he was completely pleased when you had complacency and you had a little bit of fire and after a while when our life is complacent the bible says he he throws spits us out he speaks to christians your life without fire hides vipers it hides demons it's a dwelling place you can be a christian name it confess it jesus have a bumper sticker have a hungry generation mug in your house have a love let love lead sticker on the door of your house but if the temperature inside here is warm demons will stay there the moment you increase the fire just a little bit they begin to come out they begin to surface sometimes you begin to feel uncomfortable about certain behavior and certain action but the best part is increasing the fire not only exposes the power of the enemy it expels it Paul threw the snake into the same fire that revealed the snake and that fire killed that snake 
see when you grow in Christ you increase the fire in your life not only you begin to see where you need deliverance but with the help of God you will be experiencing deliverance by keep growing in Christ can somebody say amen can somebody say amen increase God's presence in your life you don't just need to have somebody to come and bring the fire on you build it put logs if you are struggling with something right now I'm gonna give you a secret don't focus on being free focus on being filled focus Paul wasn't looking for a snake he wasn't going on a snake hunt he looked for logs the more logs he put the more fire he had and the more fire he had the more snakes were killed even if that snake bit you and it's fasted means it's holding on to you listen by having a increased presence of God in your life morning prayers regular fasting regular Bible reading not just watching all kinds of funny and hilarious fails on YouTube but watching sermons watching TB Joshua John Chi watching Joel Osteen and watching all of these anointed men of God watching Joseph Prince watching things on grace when you begin to kind of watch testimonies from CBN next thing that happens is that snake that's holding on to you the fire is getting stronger 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 and you will begin to see your life will change not because you went on a witch hunt but because you went increasing the flame inside of your heart the Bible says you know the truth and the truth will set you free that means as you grow in the knowledge of God you become more free amen I always like to use the story of how little chick chickens are born a little chicken is inside of the egg and as the hen sits on the eggs the little chicken gets stronger inside stronger inside stronger inside until the little chicken is so big that the shell is a tight space for her see sometimes when you're just beginning your walk with God you can still be cussing you can still be doing this and you honestly feel completely fine with it somebody tells you like I don't feel convicted but until you grow you grow you grow and you begin to feel that that very behavior is no longer fitting for your spiritual life and then comes a point when the mother chicken she doesn't break the egg she keeps sitting on the egg until the chicken inside gets so big that the bigness of the chicken no longer is fitting for the size of the shell and she snaps and breaks the shell that's exactly how many of us experience freedom we begin to grow and grow and grow until the shell around our life that seems to hold us hostage and we cry out to God to break it and God says I'm not gonna break it I'm gonna be with you and help you to grow and you will snap that out of your life by growing in Jesus Christ can somebody say amen I want you to see this scripture I want you to see the scripture where Apostle Paul says there is no fear I'm, I'm sorry Apostle John says there is no fear in love watch this but perfect love casts out fear you know that this word casts out is the same word Jesus used when he cast out devils see we receive love from God that's not the love that casts out things from our life perfect means mature but when you mature in the fire of God you grow in the fire of God that very fire inside of you begins to do deliverance spirit of fear spirit of anxiety spirit of addiction that spirit the Bible says perfect means mature when the fire is maturing inside of me it begins to consume the very other things that are bad inside of my life that's why never underestimate the power of your momentum and your growth and the rhythm you have with the Holy Spirit we put too much hope in the prayer of one man of God and put too little expectation on the lifestyle of your prayer, your fasting and your drawing to the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen. Put your hands together for Jesus Christ. Number three, I want us to shift from a slave to a soldier. We shift from a slave to a soldier. When Israel was in Egypt they were slaves therefore they didn't fight in Egypt Moses fought Moses came with plagues and he crushed the power of Pharaoh and God delivered them so with that kind of a mindset they expected that God will also give them promised land where they will go to promised land and God will squash all the enemies on their way and God didn't do that the promised land they had to no longer be slaves in their mind they had to be soldiers in their mind in the promised land in the beginning of your walk with God you're a slave meaning you need a prayer line you need someone to come in and knock that thing out 
and when that thing gets knocked out of your life you feel a sense of relief but rarely listen up rarely will you experience complete freedom just from that you will still have philistines jebusites Marisites and all other sites that will still kind of linger there and there you don't need just Moses you need to mature to become a soldier a soldier means you don't wait for God to send the plague God is waiting on you to send you God wants to kill the slavery mindset wilderness is a time where slavery mindset dies unfortunately some of us are married to that mindset so we die with it and we never enter into a season into a part of our life where we fight we always need a Moses and the reason why is because of a slavery mindset God wants to bring a mindset in you of a soldier slave mindset says God deliver me a soldier mind says God you are with me and I'm gonna fight a slavery mindset says father you didn't give me a go to go rejoice with my friends and God says I thought you grew up already I thought you heard that I divided the possessions between him and you that's your stuff I gave it to you I can't give you more than what I gave you go and get your own goat meaning I gave you that victory I got you out of the main big problems and not only I gave you small freedom I gave you big authority act on it fight with it don't wait until the preacher will come but I remember I would even pray for some time for people and they experience freedom the next day they come back especially at the conference they say pastor but I still have this little bitty little bitty thing I was like how big is it size of a spider or an elephant a, a size of a mosquito I was like squash it he said but I want you to squash it I'm gonna tell you why God doesn't deliver us in prayer lines and deliverance services completely let me give you this verse look at this verse from judges in this verse God said why he leaves us out he says that I leave certain enemies for this reason that I will test you whether you're gonna obey God and I will teach you to fight to two reasons anytime you wondered why the Lord didn't deliver me completely why he gave me just the main deliverances I want you to remember this test somebody say test so it means God is testing when you are still struggling with that will you choose to obey me because it's not hard to obey God when you when nothing is pulling for your attention test and then secondly he says I will teach you somebody say teach what does God want me to teach you not patience but fighting God doesn't want to teach me to struggle he wants me to teach me to fight God doesn't want to teach me to strive he wants to teach me to fight he says I will teach you to fight God allows certain things to linger in your life to build within you a mechanism of a warrior because even when you overcome that issue you will still have many other battles to fight that will not relate to you it will relate to your destiny and destinies of other people and you will need the skills to be a fighter Jesus wept but he never complained Jesus wasn't a whiner Jesus was a warrior God isn't interested in just delivering you from slavery he wants to form within you a soldier and to do that sometimes certain things are left on purpose God leaves those little mosquitoes and there's those little spiders why so you will exercise your dominion but you keep saying Lord but you do that and God says I gave you that power I want to help those people here who maybe feel like but the addiction that I have the struggle that I have is so much stronger than I I want you to remember this Bob Larson is the one that told me this he said this, he said the, the part of your life Satan doesn't have is always stronger than the part of your life he does occupy. And the story, he used the story that really kind of helped me. He says the guy who had thousands of demons, he was running naked, he was already mental, he lived on a graveyard, he was chained up and broke every chain. Yet there was still small percent that the devil couldn't take him. Running naked living on the, on, on the graveyards but there was one thing Satan couldn't take you know what he couldn't take he couldn't take his ability to run to Jesus imagine naked out of his mind still the Bible says when he saw Jesus he ran he didn't walk he didn't jog he didn't drag he ran to Jesus and the second thing Satan couldn't take is the Bible says and he worshiped Jesus and the demons started manifesting 
See, when you start using the part of your life that is still free and push it to the maximum, you will find yourself at the feet of the Messiah delivering you from those parts you have no control over. Hallelujah! Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. The part you have freedom over, use that. Maximize that. Push that through. If a mental guy naked on the graveyard could still find a flickering light inside of him to say yes I'm naked, yes I'm crazy but I'm gonna run to Jesus and I will kneel before him and the demons took over and they were free. Amen. Because we know two things, demons never bring people to Jesus and demons don't worship Jesus. Why did demons fall from heaven? Because they didn't want to worship him and anything you know about demons is this, they always draw people from God. That's why many times when it's your day of deliverance, you start feeling sick in your stomach and you quickly run to the toilet. Or you quickly, you need to go home, you feel that a rush. Every time, demons never bring people to the prayer line. They try to cause people not to come to the prayer line. So the fact that we know the devil didn't bring him to Jesus. He's somewhere inside, found this small 1% to say, but I'm gonna fight, I fight. I'm gonna drag that naked, out of crazy, out of my mind body and I'm gonna drop it at the feet of Jesus. And that's where his freedom came. Don't give too much power to the devil. Even if he got 99% of you, that 1% is more stronger than the 99 he has. Devil is no match to the power of a human will because we were made in the image and likeness of God. God will never and ever let the devil take 100% of you. Can somebody say amen? If you're addicted to drugs, if you're addicted to alcohol, if you're addicted to pornography, if you're addicted to gambling and you may feel like but I keep falling, I keep tripping and I, I just don't have any power. No, you don't have all the power. But listen, do not discriminate yourself. Don't let the devil lie to you that you can't change. No, you can't. But with the power of God, when you use the little bit of that you have, God will say, I will step in. I will help you and I will get rid of those demons even if it's 6,000 of them. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Lord one more time. And the last point which I believe is the strongest and most important thing. It's offensive. Might be. You're not a pig. Say praise the Lord. So don't live in the mud. What I mean by that is every time you fall into an addiction or a behavior caused by an addiction, that causes extreme guilt and condemnation. And what the devil wants, the sin usually lasts about 15 minutes to 20, maybe in an hour, depending on how good of a sinner you are. But typically sin doesn't last very long. An affair, the act of looking at pornography, the act of smoking, the act of getting high, the act of gambling, it, it doesn't last very long. What I'm going to tell you what lasts very long is that through that sin, Satan drags you into the mud of guilt. And then, he wants you to live in that mud. Means he wants you to keep punishing yourself for what you did. Hoping that somehow God will see that you're making yourself miserable for what you did. And be like more sympathetic to you. More compassionate to you. A pig loves the mud. A sheep cries in the mud. Sheep fall into the mud as well. But pigs, they run, they play, they live in the mud. You are a sheep. Mud is not your world. But sometimes through sin we get slipped and we fall. One of the principles that I've learned, the first time when I was a teenager, very young teenager, when I came to the pastor and I confessed my sin of, of falling into pornography. It was a few days before the encounter. We had an encounter that I was leading and I was supposed to pray for other people to be free. On Friday and on Thursday I found myself in sin. The shame and the guilt that I felt it wasn't equal to I think if I would have cut myself to pieces I wouldn't it wouldn't even the pain wouldn't feel to that. The embarrassment, the, the shame, the hypocrisy it it was unbelievable unbelievable sense of just I am a young person I, I, I don't know how to even deal with that. I remember I ran to the pastor and I said I can't do this encounter. I need the encounter and pastor told me something during that time I don't remember the exact words but I know how it made me feel 
that forever helped me to deal with any kind of sin or weakness in my life and he, he used the phrase he says that he says sin is not Satan's goal for you he says sin is his method his real goal is where he's succeeding right now is guilt and shame he says how long he says what what pains you what hurts you is it the sin I'm like no it's not the pornography that was hurting me it was the guilt that was hurting me I want you to know one thing sin is not the problem even if you feel like but yeah it left imprint in my mind and it's so bad the alcohol is not the problem drugs is not the problem God is able to forgive you in a very second that you ask him for but the problem is this is that when you receive when you ask for forgiveness because you don't receive forgiveness you keep punishing yourself and devil keeps you in the mud and sometimes we sin for 15 minutes but we are in guilt for 15 days you know what was the goal the goal was never the sin the goal was just a way to get you to the real issue which will destroy your life it's not the sin it's the condemnation condemnation is so powerful it will cause that sin to happen again condemnation is the demonic because condemnation says this the longer I condemn myself the more pleasing I will be to God it's a spit to the face of Jesus Christ on the cross condemnation says but if I make myself feel bad I won't do it again actually you end up doing worse things that you did before when my car is dirty I don't avoid puddles on the road and when my car is clean I would drive the other side of the city never to find a place that is wet being feeling guilty always like a magnet draws more sin into your life what you need to learn is what I had to learn in the beginning in that moment not only ask God for forgiveness receive forgiveness and give myself forgiveness and get up pretend it never happened the devil would sit and say but you're abusing the grace of God the devil would say but see you keep falling into the same sin willfully but that's the devil that is not Holy Spirit saying you use too much of my blood Jesus will never say that the devil will say see but that means you fall again did you know that all of my future sins my past sins all of them my past sins that Jesus forgave me 2,000 years ago all of them were future sins that Jesus forgave me all of them all the sins 2,000 years ago were my future sins not my past Jesus paid the price for every sin I've done every sin I'm doing and that I will do I understand it smells like are you giving people a license no I'm giving you a power not to sin I'm gonna use a story that forever has helped me and I believe it will help you it's a story of a woman caught in adultery she wasn't coming to Jesus to repent she was dragged to Jesus she was in the middle of intercourse and man came in took her out they left the man most likely that man was one of the Pharisees they dragged the woman out probably not fully clothed yet she's not running to Jesus like the other women bawling and say Jesus I'm a sinner she's running to Jesus she got caught she's not even confessing her sins you don't see one mention saying Jesus I'm sorry I hurt my husband I betrayed my children I betrayed God she's just there not repenting and the first thing Jesus does he knows they're gonna kill her he knows people are gonna kill her Jesus protects her not from God not from himself but from condemnation of other people and he protects her to that degree where people drop the stones and when she's protected from them I want you to see this Jesus protects her who doesn't even ask for repentance she doesn't even acknowledge her sin he protects her from condemnation and then when she looks at him and he says listen the only person who has the right to condemn you is not the devil see devil is a liar cheater devil is a messed up person he, he tries to condemn you he has no right to condemn you I can condemn you and he says I don't condemn you how can you say that Jesus when she didn't repent I believe God did it on purpose to send a message to you how much more when you repent 
why did the devil devil lies that when you repented that now Jesus won't give you the gift of no condemnation if he gave it to a woman who got caught and never acknowledged her sin and then he says this to her go and sin no more when you receive the gift that God is not against you only then you have the power to go and sin no more until you receive the gift of no guilt and condemnation you will live in that sin again and again and again I have a message for some of you here today you need to learn to forgive yourself you may say well it's easy to say that but I, I fall into the same sin if Jesus expects you to forgive someone 300 times a day over 300 times do you think God doesn't have the grace to forgive you for the very thing he's asking you to do someone else God is bigger than you think God sees your heart God sees how much you're like a sheep crying in that addiction or crying in that mud or crying in that sin God sees that God sees your efforts and that you're you're weak and when you when you trip and when you fall and you come for forgiveness he's not there to punish you if he punished Jesus Jesus never said hey guys I'm dying on the cross but can, can please can you help me with just a few more ounces of blood because I didn't have enough to cover your sins the blood of Jesus on the cross was enough when you fall into that sin in the process of deliverance you will fall learn to get up learn to ask for forgiveness receive forgiveness and give forgiveness to yourself in three minutes don't give the devil three hours do not give the devil two weeks don't give yourself say well uh, next day no right there on the spot guilt raging like a sea inside of you demons screaming from every single side and repeated cycle you only see how you fell 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 in that moment see the blood see the son of God nailed to the cross for people like you see his blood touching you and receive it by faith just receive it by faith and then tell yourself this never happened why because the cross happened and you will walk out of the room and the devil will say it did happen you will say shut up in Jesus name and you will tell the devil to get off of you you will see this you will sin this is what's gonna happen first you will sin less and then you will sin no more in that sin that's exactly what happened to me as I learned to get up faster from that sin I fell less frequently until few years after those teenage years I've seen the victory over that sin it happened supernaturally it didn't happen after a particular prayer meeting it happened because I didn't first I wallowed up in that guilt for weeks pastor taught me shake it off he says you're not perfect get up and I said does that mean I can minister with sin he says no 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 no. nobody's saying that he says I want you to minister with God's gift of no condemnation with God's gift of grace with God's gift of power of God's gift of the blood of Jesus Christ only then there is victory can somebody say amen can somebody shout hallelujah hallelujah you may say grace is you're twisting grace no it's amazing grace don't remove word amazing out of it and until you experience it you won't be able to say it's amazing but when you've experienced it and it delivers you and it cleanses you then you will say grace powerful grace it not only cleanses me from sin it delivers me from sin and it helps me to be patient with other people's sin can somebody say amen?